Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. Just a few housekeeping notes for today's episode. I mentioned in a previous episode that the Monster Professor is going bi-weekly for a while, in part because I have another audio project in the works. Um, Others have asked what that other project is. I don't want to reveal it till it's done, so I'll let you know when it is done, but I want to keep it a surprise for right now. Um, I realized there were a lot of monstrous birds I didn't get to talk about in my last episode on monstrous birds, such as, say, Daphne du Maurier's uh, famous story, The Birds, that got picked up by Alfred Hitchcock, among other things. Um, uh, I didn't mention, well, I haven't really mentioned at all a lot of the monsters out of Tolkien's mythology and Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. Um... And a lot of you have pointed out that you want more on the gothic. Well, I've got another really cool different type of episode scheduled for the gothic. I think you're going to enjoy that one. I'm going to get back around to more birds, uh, uh, to more Tolkien eventually. And so just note that I have noted such things and they're planned, scheduled in the works in the future. So stay tuned for those. But for today's episode, let's talk about giants. I think probably the most famous of giants, the one that will come to most people's minds, uh, will be Goliath, as in the one that David fought in the Bible, in the Old Testament. I think that one is worth some mention, but he's not my favorite. I have two favorites that I want to get to in a little bit. Um, You know what? I forget going with the most popular one. I want to go straight to my most favorite. Uh, the first of the two is Og. He comes out of the Bible too. A, a brief mention of him, uh, King of Basham, Og, this giant. He ends up uh, at one point uh, causing Moses and the Israelites some problem as, problems as in he blocks their way as they travel through the desert when they're wandering. Well, but the most interesting stories about Og are the extra-biblical stories, because a lot of the rabbis noticed that Og the giant is showing up in these stories that are post-flood, right? Um, post-Diluvian stories, and the flood was supposed to have been the thing that wiped out the giant, so maybe we'll backtrack to that in just a little bit, but there shouldn't be any more giants after Noah's flood, so what's he doing around Moses' time? And so a lot of these little um, folklore stories started building up around, extra-biblical stories started building up around and outside of the texts, a lot of them about Og. So one of them is that as Noah gathers his families and the, his family and the animals into the into the ark and the waters are rising and rising and wiping out all life that isn't on Noah's ark on the planet Og swims over to the ark and climbs on top of its roof and holds on there now Og is something like what nine cubits tall. I mean, that's a lot. Uh, He's a huge guy, but others have him uh, so big that he actually walked along the surface of the earth, as in he walked along the ocean floor with his head above the oceans of of the flood, the, the new ocean, walked along Noah's Ark. So some had him huge, but either way, he's this giant. And in the clinging to the roof story, 
He's up there on top of it for 40 days and 40 nights clinging to the roof while Noah and his family and all the animals, they're inside and they can, they know that they have a giant clinging onto their roof as it's raining, as the ark is getting hit and moved around by the waves and they can hear the wood creaking and the timbers above them straining by the weight of this giant up there. But Og thinks that Noah doesn't know that he's up there. And Noah knows he's up there, but he realizes that it's safer if Og doesn't think that he knows that he knows he's up there. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, Noah and his family have to like pretend that there's not a giant on their roof. And how terrifying is that is that idea just 40 days and 40 nights of darkness and rain and waves and hearing the creaking of this giant on your roof pretending that he's not there because you don't want him knowing that he knows that you're up there that he's up there (laughs) that's so cool but another one another one of the aug stories is uh that he actually pays noah passage Noah is not supposed to allow him on the ark. In fact, there's no room, of course. Um, but Og, in the last moments, he's he has his fingers on the uh, on the rim of Noah's ark, clinging to it as kind of like a, a life preserver, and he's begging to be allowed to hold on through the whole flood. And Noah's like, no, I'm not supposed to let you, I'm supposed to let you die. I'm not supposed to let you survive like this. And Og says, look, you forgot these grape seeds. I've got some grape seeds and you'll trust me. You'll really want these things after the flood recedes because you can grow grapes and make wine out of it. And Noah had not heard of this before. And so he's like, okay, I'll take these grape seeds as payment for passage. And so for the entirety of the flood in this story, Og like holds on to the ark and the ark floats him through the waves and and the waters until the floods finally recede, at which point no Og takes off and does his own thing elsewhere in the world. And Noah plants those seeds, grows grapes, makes wine out of it and becomes a drunkard for the rest of his days. Thanks to Og. So those are at least a couple of the Og stories that I really like. He actually showed up in uh, in some fiction of mine at one point, um, a, a piece of a book that the book never got published in its entirety. I don't think it needs to, but there are sections of it that got published and he showed up in one of those or my version of them. Uh, in my version, uh, he has no feet. He crawls around on his hands and knees because Moses cut him down at his feet. Um, and he's a, he's a curious fellow. I, my heart goes out to Og. Um, but I'm, I dropped a few references to giants and the floods as if everybody already knows how that went down or what that means. Um, and, and I'm reminding myself of a weird encounter, uh, years and years and years ago on, uh, on the radio, I was driving around late one night. I think I just ended some midnight shift or something. So it's like one o'clock in the morning driving around and I'm just flipping through the radio. I think it was AM and I hear these people talking on this, on this talk show late at night. And one of them is asking the other one for clarification. He goes, okay, the giants of the Solomon islands these aren't the same giants who built the pyramids, right? And the guest is like, oh, no, no, no. Those are obviously two very different species of giants. And the, the host is like, okay, okay, good. So let's move on. And I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What have I not let, what have I not been let in on? I mean, you've got, you've got these two people clarifying that it, everybody knows that they're different species of giants. And it's assumed that one of these kinds were the ones that that built the pyramids. We just want to make sure we're not talking about the same race of giants who like giants built the pyramids. Why didn't I know about this kind of stuff? Turns out it was a radio show by um, a guy named Art Bell and it was coast to coast AM. And I think there was some different show like after dark 
book with Art Bell or something like that. And he talked, he, uh, it was mostly like this paranormal, uh, radio show and they would talk about aliens and, and, uh, I guess giants and ghosts and these kinds of things. That was my first encounter with it. Just the matter of fact nature of discussing the building of the pyramids by different types of giants absolutely fascinated me. That's related to our uh, our word cyclopean, by the way, which very often, especially in the works of Lovecraft, but elsewhere, uh, cyclopean gets applied uh, to large and ancient works of architecture, mostly with huge slabs of stone. Um, cyclopean meaning that the cyclopes and the cyclopes must have built a, the the different types of cyclop giants because there's no way that normal sized humans could have cut and moved such blocks to make such ancient architecture and so when later peoples came along and found these ancient temples or these ancient ziggurats with uh, stones the size of houses arranged, they thought, well, this must have been a race of giants. Okay, so what about the race of giants? Um, if we're going to stick back to like biblical stuff, Genesis 6-4 is where a whole bunch of really cool um uh, giant stories kind of grew out of because here it mentions uh pre-deluge um that the pre-flood that there are these sons of god and, and in the original hebrew like the sons of elohim which is like the sons of the gods they see uh, human women and they take them to be fair and so they take them for themselves and there's a suggestion that the thing they begat are the Nephilim. Although there's some debate on that. Some say, well, the way it's worded is that these giants were around beforehand. Uh, these are just two different incidences happening concurrently. The, I think the, the more common interpretation is that the Nephilim are the offspring of the sons of men. So I guess these angels or these, some say fallen angels, but I think we'd see something a little bit differently if they were full on like demons. I think those are, anyway, we won't get, we won't get into the mythology of that quite yet. We'll have a different episode for angels and demons and these kinds of things. Either way, there's some type of divine creature, uh, that either that mated with, you uh, Oh, human women against their will or not, it's not clear. And then the offspring were the Nephilim, which is another kind of word for this giant type of thing. And there were giants and men of renown and the world was wicked. And that's when Yahweh decided he really needed to flood the earth to wipe it out and start over. Um, but there were, there were other giants that showed up afterward. Um, the Anak, uh, that, or the Anakim and the, uh, Raphaim uh, were a couple of races of giants, um, that show up at different, different points. Actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's, uh, there's a book, I think it was, yeah, it was called the Book of Giants. Um, and that's, this is a fascinating one because it tells the tale of, the, the story leading up to the flood, but from the giant's perspective, it tells of the, this kingdom of giants and how like, decadent and depraved they are and how awful they are. But every now and then we, they would gather in council and one of the giants had a dream of this great flood that would wipe out their way of life and all their kind. And then the smaller race would come and, and dominate the world. And he told the rest of the, the giants this dream at this big council and they brushed him off and blew him off. And they said, we're giants. There's nothing that could wipe us out, especially not a flood. And so they didn't prepare for it. But of course, Noah did, and he and his family survived, and the giants were wiped out. So that was from the Dead Sea Scrolls, a bunch of really cool books uh, in there that's they're worth checking out for sure. Okay, so let's so let's stay with the Bible for just a little bit longer and talk about Goliath. He's that 
he's that famous uh, Philistine that would uh, that challenged uh, in this battle forty days and forty nights Saul versus the Philistines and the and the armies of Saul. Saul was not the best king. Things were kind of falling apart on him. The Philistines were rising and doing well, especially with their warrior Goliath. Some of the older texts have him um, at like six nine, six feet nine inches tall. Once you work out the cubits of the of of the measurements given to him, um, some slightly newer versions had him at like nine feet something tall, and there seems to be no clear agreement. And so it's kind of one of those, I think, kind of like pick your version or pick your height uh, for Goliath yourself. I like, of course, to imagine the nine feet tall some version of him because it's just more interesting to me. And so Goliath would uh, fight by champion, and, and it and it suggests um, in in the text that there everybody already understands that they're fighting by champion. Now, I'm not so sure uh, that fighting by champion was really happening at that, at the time that it's supposed to occur. That was much more of a, of a Mediterranean Greek kind of thing and a little bit uh, farther West in Europe. And so here's what, here's what champion means. It's when two armies gather and they face off kind of out of range of any missile attacks like arrows and, and stones and stuff. So they gather and they line up and then one member of one army walks out into the middle of the battlefield, the man in the middle, the man in between, and then he will issue a challenge either in general to the greatest warrior on the other side or call out someone else specifically. And so one other member from the other army would gather in the middle and they would have their fight to submission or death or fleeing. And that would be the battle of the day. And so they would kind of rack up day after day, uh, kind of keep a tally of who's winning, whose champion is the best, and they would kind of let that decide who's winning this war of theirs. This is actually how the Trojan War uh, went down. Uh, the uh, Homer's Iliad picks up in about year 10 of this 10-year war, and for nine years it hasn't been like thousands of men versus thousands of men. It's been day after day of battle by champion. There were skirmishes with uh, larger groups of people throughout it, of course, um, and sieges on the walls or, or attempts at sieges. But a lot of what went down was battle by champion. And so um, actually in the Iliad, uh, there's a there's a character named Nestor. Now he's a kind of a wise old guy. And there's some mention of his fame that he gained when he was just a runt. He was like the youngest child of a bunch, I don't know, like eight or 12 children, something like that. And he didn't count for much. And there was this, there was this giant who was beating the hell out of people and winning all these fights by champion and everyone was scared of him. And then Nestor begged for a chance to go and face him. And everybody told him, no, you don't stand a chance. But Nestor did it anyway. And he took his little club and he went out there and faced this big giant and he beat him. And that's how he gained renown and respect from his father and rose up through the ranks. And that's a... And the Iliad, that's hinting back at a much, much older story. So this is a this is a massively old story of this little underdog uh, rising up to go face the the giant champion. Now, did the David Goliath story take from the Nestor one? Um, I don't know. Some people suspect that they do, since the Nestor one is is uh, much older, or there are hints at it being much much older than the David story. Um, but anyway, so Goliath. So in David's story, he's just this little shepherd boy. Um, there are hints that instead he's the shield bearer. Those are inconsistencies in the story. So there were different versions that got mashed together. Uh, 
but he's the one brave enough to take on Goliath, even though King Saul shouldn't be the one that faces him. And he, he won't. I mean, Saul was like a, a head taller than everyone else in Israel. So he should have uh, faced him, but he was too afraid. He was a coward. And so David gathered up five stones and then slung one of them, hit Goliath in the head, killed him. David beheads him, takes his armor. And his story continues. I've I've often wondered why five stones. He if he were so sure, if he had so much faith in the Lord of Israel, Yahweh, why would he need five if it was only going to take one? If it, if he only needed one stone, uh, somebody told me that maybe it was for Goliath's four other brothers. Um, but he didn't expect the army to kind of like fold as quickly as he did. So he didn't need the other four. I'm not quite sure. I think there's something else to it. I remember seeing in some rabbinic, uh, literature that he had seven stones and he, and he used the seven stones to spell out the name of Yahweh. And so then he took the first of the letters and flung it. And that's all it took to defeat Goliath. I don't, I don't know really what's going on there, but, uh, later we get a mention of these giants who were related to Goliath having six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot with this suggestion that this was a genetic feature of these of, of Goliath's uh, uh, family line. And so I think we can safely assume that Goliath had uh, 12 fingers and 12 toes, which is pretty cool. I've mentioned on a previous episode, it might have been way back in the original uh, Monsters and Literature episodes, but I mentioned my take on how giants work in these old stories and, and in myth. I think it's like this, um, that when you see a giant, you see this incarnate representation of the old order, like the corrupt, decadent, and tyrannical status quo, the thing that needs to be challenged by somebody who is young or younger or clever or both. Some, somebody who comes in with an unorthodox solution or an unorthodox way to wipe out the old kind. And so in, um, in the, the time I mention it was when Odysseus is trapped in Polyphemus's cave, the giant Cyclops, um, in the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus uses trickery at, to escape, uh, Polyphemus's world. Um, and I think every little bit of that trickery is in a way how you might deal with like this tyrannical overbearing government that watches everything that you do that tries to hold you in, whether that's the state or that's the traditions or what have you. I think Goliath fits into that too. This old decadent way, not only, uh, kind of represented by Saul as well, but Saul's world of the Philistines causing all this pro all these problems and the Philistines themselves, everything kind of culminates in the image of Goliath this old way of doing things that just can't be beaten by normal stand by normal approaches. You can't just don your armor, grab a sword, go out there and think you stand a chance against Goliath. You're just going to get killed and there's no way out of this, but it takes someone to come along with this unorthodox approach. I think that Noah's flood and the surviving of the flood was, was an odd way to kind of get past the old world of the giants, this old tyranny. And so, uh, and, and I think, I think there are plenty of historical examples of not giants of, um, plenty. Well, there are actually plenty of giants in history. Uh, well, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but of cultures that had, uh, that cultures that had an old way or an old state or an old system, and they seem very giant-like, like it's too big and bloated and inefficient. It has too much of this gluttonous appetite. It won't let you go. It watches everything you do, and you can't beat it by normal means. Uh, I've one person suggested to me that uh, currently United States of America fits all of 
of these things. Uh, I won't go so far as to say that, nor will I fully deny it. But I think that's at least one way to look at how giants function or a different kind of uh, a different kind of interpretation that lends credence to giant stories. There's a lot of applicability and what you look, what you see when you see giants and old stories and how they're taken care of. And then conf- and then compare that to the kind of giants you face. Uh, I think we discussed that same kind of thing with the Beowulf monsters. I think that same kind of thing can be applied to dragons. Like maybe there are dragons in the world or dragons in your life that you need to fight. I think uh, another hugely archetypical uh, kind of monster um, kind of that balances out the gi- the dragon side of it is the giants, and that might in fact be one of the reasons why giants show up in every culture that I know of. Um, I said witches do in a previous episode. I said in every culture has some type of witch. I think that's I think that's true. I think that's the case. If you uh, combine ghosts and spirits together then every culture has had ghost slash spirit. If you just say only ghosts of the dead or only spirits, um, I'm not sure that holds up across cultures. But if you combine the two, and I think that's fair, then they all have that. So we've got witches, we've got ghost spirits, and I would add giants to that. Now, dragons and serpents are almost everywhere. Some of the some of the indigenous African cultures don't have those so much, but they've got giants and witches and ghosts and spirits. Everybody does. So why is that? Um, well, maybe one take on it is it's this it's this image or this it's the it's this way of seeing the old order that needs to be put down and fought against. I think that even shows up in in a lot of mythologies too, like uh, not only Greek but in Norse mythologies where the the giants, the are uh, the the gods, the Aesir, the one the ones we're supposed to root for are constantly fighting against this older order of crude and vicious and tyrannical giants. Um, they eventually lose, though, in Ragnarok. Well, everybody loses in Ragnarok. That's why it's so cool. So since I just mentioned uh, the Norse giants, and since earlier I mentioned that, that I have two favorite giants and I haven't gotten to the second one, let's go there now. The first of my two favorite giants is Og, as I said, but the second is a Scandinavian giantess, actually, and her name is Skadi. I think it can be pronounced Scotty, S-K-A-D-I, or S-K-A-T-H-E, or T-H-I, as in Scotty, Skathe, Scotty, and so I'll probably switch interchangeably. I'm not sure there's a single correct pronunciation. She's fantastic, and in fact, she's, although she doesn't show up as much when people talk about Norse mythology, she's not popular like Odin, Thor, Loki, some of these others. Uh, she, she meant a lot to the Scandinavian people. That's where they get the name Scandinavian. They're named after Scotty, the people of Scotty, the giantess, also called sometimes the snowshoe goddess. All right, so she is the daughter of this giant. His name is Thiazi, and he has this homestead way up in the peaks of the mountains. He has uh, source powers of sorcery. He can turn himself into an eagle, for instance. Uh, she's his daughter. She lives up there with him, and she hopes for nothing more to, than to live out her life with her father, and then when he passes to, to inherit the homestead and live out her life there. She loves uh, hunting by bow and arrow the wild beasts of the mountains, on ski, she goes on skis through the snows. Uh, skis and snowshoes are interchangeable, so when they call her the snowshoe goddess, or the this the the giantess on skis, they're the all of that's interchangeable. Um, but at one point, um, Theazi is going around in the form of an eagle, trying to like trick a meal here and there, and he ends up tricking Loki out of some food. And Loki uh, 
and and tricks Loki into a promise. Loki hates this, um, but gets trapped into this this kind of intricate plot. Anyway, it, it, we can skip over some of the in, uh, intricacies and get to the part that brings Scotty into the story. And so Loki, in the form of a hawk or a falcon, is fleeing Theozzi in the form of an eagle. And he's fleeing, trying to get back to the safety of Asgard because he uh, he deserves a, a beating from Theozzi. Um, and so the Asgardians see this and they're very much uh, invested in Loki winning this thing and what he's bringing back that he stole from Theozzi. And so the moment Loki in Falcon form is past the ramparts of Asgard, then they they throw up this fire. They burn all these pine shavings and they create this big smoke and fire in the sky. And and Theozzi in the form of the eagle hits this and can't see and his and his feathers are singed and so he falls to the ground in Asgard. At which point all the gods gather around and just beat him to death horribly. Um. And so they think things are done, right? So they've just taken this big sorcerer, scary giant, and they've all gathered around and beat him. Well, little did they know she had, he had a daughter. And Scotty finds out that they tricked and then ganged up on and then murdered her father. And she is furious. In fact, she has every right to be furious because they weren't really in the right in, uh, in murdering him. Maybe you could have said that they, the gods were in the right in like defeating him, but not murdering him as they did. And especially not through trickery. That was low down of Scandinavian, Scandinavian people to do, or even gods. And and so she is furious. So up in the mountains, she dons her helmet. She dons her coat of mail. She starts gathering weapons, spears and axes and swords. She gathers shields, every piece of military combat equipment that the, the Viking people could have imagined. Scotty has it. She is loaded down and she is ready to go. And what's her plan? Just to march on into Asgard and slaughter all of the Viking gods, all of the Norse gods? That is exactly her plan. She's going to ski down from the mountains with all this equipment and just march right up to the walls of Asgard, kick open the damn doors and slaughter every single one of them. And so she's on their way and they find out the Odin, Thor, all the rest of the powerful Asgardians, they find out Scotty's on the way and she's furious. And they think, oh my God. <laughs> well, not oh my God, <laughs> because they are the gods. But they think, oh no, she's going to do, she is actually going to kick down the doors and then kill every one of us. We got to come up with a plan. Like they are terrified of her. She's awesome. And especially when she's furious like this. And so here she comes and they're like, okay, 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 let's, uh, let's placate her in some way. We, we, let's say we owe the debt as we do about her dad. Let's, uh, let's do a few things for her. Okay. So one of those things is they promise any one of themselves as a mate or a husband to her. She gets to choose which one is going to be married off to her. So she gets there and they're like, wait, 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 don't kill us and don't start slaughtering us yet. Um, pick any one of us as your husband and he's yours. And she's like, um, she, that's enough to pause her. And she's like, okay, well, Balder is like the Apollo of the Norse gods. He's beautiful and perfect. Everybody loves him. She's thinking, well, maybe if I had him, I would be, I would be a little bit more relaxed and maybe not slaughter everybody. And she's like, okay, I'm, I'm up for this deal. And the gods are like, oh crap, but we can't lose Boulder. We can't lose him. He's the most popular one out of all of us. We don't. So they go, okay, but here's the, here's the only catch. You can only pick your husband by looking at his feet. And so they all lined up behind this curtain in which she can only see their feet. And she thinks, <laughs> Scotty thinks, well, 
Balder is so beautiful that his feet must also be beautiful. And so I'm going to just pick the most beautiful feet. And so <laughs> she goes down the line. She sees the most beautiful feet and she goes, that's the man I want. I want that one. Well, little did she know it was actually the feet of Njord. And he has a homestead and a harbor down at the beach in the ocean. He's not even actually one of the Asir. He is one of the Vanir, a different race of gods that had this old feud with the Asir, the, the gods of Asgard. And they ended up coming to a truce. And part of it was trading off hostages. And so the Asir let one of the Asgardians go. Uh, to the Vanir, and the Vanir let one of their own go to here uh, to Asgard, and that was Njord. And so she ends up picking Njord, Njord for the husband. And so she's kind of okay with it, but she didn't get what she wanted, and so she's not entirely placated. So they go, okay, we'll also make you laugh. And <laughs> And it's not clear whether this is like a, a deal or what they just decide they need, if they can just get her laughing now, it will be okay. And so everybody turns to Loki and so it's up to Loki. And so he puts on this performance, does all these tricks, makes a fool out of himself, all these kinds of things. And he finally figures out a way to make her laugh. And that's pretty good. And so they got her a, a new a new counterpart for her homestead. They got her a husband now, now that she lost her father they got her laughing and cheered her up and they're not out of the they're not in the clear yet it's because they haven't fully paid their debt and honoring Thiazi, the guy that the giant they murdered and so odin says okay here's what i'll do i'll take the eyes of Thiazi and throw them up into the sky and make stars of them so he takes the two remaining eyeballs of her murdered father throws them up in the sky. We have two beautiful stars in the sky now because of that. And that's enough. And so that placates her. And so she grabs her husband and marches on up back to the mountain top and to her homestead. Well, her, her life problems don't end there. Actually, she gets up there and for nine days, um, her husband Njord is up there in the snowy homestead up there and he absolutely hates it. He tells her, he says, the mountains I loathed no longer than nine nights did I stay there. The howling of the wolves seemed ugly to me compared with the hooping of the swans. And so Scott, he's like, fine, we'll go down to your homestead by the beach and we'll try that out. And they do. And she absolutely hates that. She says, I could not sleep by the shore of the sea for the noise of the mew that awakened me. The bird that flew each dawn from the deep. She hates that. And so she goes back up to her mountain homestead. And that's where she goes about and spends her life on skis and, and hunting wild animals with bow and arrow. And they call her the snowshoe goddess. And Njord stays down uh, at the beach and he has a he has a couple of kids, Frey and Freya. Uh, Freya is famous for uh, driving the chariot pulled by cats. Uh, and now it's I don't think, however, uh, that Scotty was necessarily the mother of Freya, although it might have been. The family trees are a little bit messed up or inconsistent, I should say, on that. But either way, we have this. They, they stayed married, but they have this irreconcilable difference. And so they live uh, at the different extremes of the world. And I mean, Scotty is just, I mean, how cool was that? And of course they, they want to name themselves the people of this mountain giantess who in her fury had all of the gods of Asgard trembling. She was about to be this one woman Ragnarok, uh, before the actual Ragnarok came, she was going to wipe them all out and they knew it. And so they had to do a, do a dating service for her. They had to do a comedy show for her and then they they had to do, uh, uh, they had to make stars in the skies for her just to calm her down enough. That's pretty freaking cool. Oh, there, uh, there are so many other giants we could talk about in, in folklore and fairy tales and in literature, um, even in history, uh, some of the, some of the tallest people to have ever lived. But 
I think we're getting close to time, so if you made it this far, you survived another episode of The Monster Professor. Hey, Christmas is coming up soon. If you're looking for a gift for someone and they're a reader and they like cool things, you might check out a novel called The Black Palace, available on Amazon.com by The Monster Professor himself, Josh Woods. Check out Josh Woods, uh, author.com, my website for more, or just check out Amazon.com for The Black Palace. I do have giants in there. I have one giant in particular. That's kind of a a, a take on these different giantesses out of Norse mythology. I think she's a fascinating character in that book. So if you're interested, check it out. Otherwise, stay tuned for the next monsters we're going to talk about in a couple weeks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Monster Professor. Monster Professor.